every country, every land, every feature therein, and every corner of this earth named. Every creature met, every planet observed, every celestial object ever appeared named. And greater still, every person, baby, elder, living, and lost one bearing a name. If anything I've ever been told, any information or emotion or wisdom or story or description, each and every single one has been uttered through the augmentation of breath. Shouldn't I then ask myself the nature of this augmented breath? If words are the mainline vessels of our interactions with the world and our observations therein, ought we understand the nature of these words better? What is their capacity? What are their downfalls? Where are they most appropriate? And how are they formed? Without even getting spiritual or religious, the etymology, as we know, of spirit is air. And the ancients would say, a spirit has taken me over, or spirits occupy me. If spirit is air, and we shift that into sounds that result in expressions, then are we not in control of said spirit, breath? Look what I'm choosing to do with it in this moment. This is a ancient fascination. What is done with the spirit? What is done with the breath? What do we say? What do we share? How we express? And the effect that that has on the perception and the manifestation of the greater world. When we were forming in the womb, we took this zygotic shape and these further utero forms that resemble the ancestors of our evolution, resembles this animal movement into mankind. And if this is so, this observation of developmental evolution, then our childhood selves resemble our deep historical development. What do I mean? We come out babbling. This senseless noise. There is no idea of meaning in this babbling. It is cathartic. It is expressive. And it comes to express emotion. It comes to express state of being. When we wake up in the morning, we might make these groaning sounds. And these groaning sounds say more than any book or paragraph of written literature could ever express. It is more plainly, directly to the point. A direct cathartic expression of the emotional state or the spirits dwelling therein, so to speak. When the child expresses, when it babbles, when it emotes, it could be a playfulness, it could be a discomfort, it could be joy. And these things are readily and immediately communicable to us. This is how it began. Long, long, long ago for us. And all too often, as a child is given words, they'll become obsessed with certain ones, certain words, and utilize it endlessly. This nonsensical fixation always lives with us. <laughs> Some words we just like inexplicably. I enjoy the word humongous, <laughs> supple, snafu. There's a silly quality that I adore in these words. And when they come up, I enjoy them. And then there are words that bring different forms of enjoyment. Conveyus, um, aqua, or continuum. This elegant, complex flavor of that 
set of sounds and association with that set of sounds. If we're particularly self-aware, we might notice that we reoccurringly use the same word quite a bit more than others. We have this kind of word defaulting that we do that varies in time. For some reason, as of late, I have found myself using the word sentient and beige much more often. And what might that say about where I'm thinking? You might notice that certain people never say certain words. It's worthy of paying attention of if somebody uses words like grateful or beautiful. If this is a word that is comfortable with their inner sanctum, something they are comfortable emitting. So there's just as much said with what is said as with what isn't said. But there's much more deeper work that we have to do here, specifically this realm of the child, this re-entering of the state where words are sounds, meaning is suspended. All that is happening right here is like the chittering of a bird. If you've ever had the privilege of being surrounded by people who all speak a foreign language, it's easier to recall this state. Now for many, this might bring on a oceanic feeling. This is uncomfortable, not knowing what's going on. But instead, this is a rare occasion that you might notice what this is actually like. If we dispel the spell of words, you notice information, particularities are being exchanged. Yes, you can see that they're quite adamant in their expressions with each other. It seems there is quite the sophisticated thing working out here. But more fundamentally than that, you can see that energy or emotion or what the ancients would call spirit is being passed around. There might be an argument, and this might be a logical point, but really, they're just batting back and forth. You might notice that this person is in a state of needing. The others might be blind to that, because they're lost in the words. And then you might notice that this person is angered. And you might get a better feeling for why that is, and how that's being met. And this person over here is aloof and withholding. You can see how they're holding it all in. They're not sharing this energy conversation. They're not participating in the exchange of word. And this one is oblivious and joyous. So on, so forth. This suspending of the word game is how you might actually see what is happening genuinely emotively and authentically especially if you get the chance to witness a lengthy conversation you'll see how often these emotional palettes swap how you might heighten in the enjoyment of this articulation or how it might move itself into a dark corner and then you'll see everybody's kind of eyebrows lower or this heightening or receding of interest. How someone can push out and pull in with the words, with the energy traveling through the vehicle of the words. And in seeing this, we can begin to understand how language is a medium for spirit, energy, emotion, what have you. And there is something truly miraculous here. We managed to invent a mode of articulation for this cacophony that is our inner sanctum and our observations of the world. And this feeling, this spirit is felt and then pushed into words. Intention is given a body 
a medium in sound. If we are truly in the state as though we were a child, suspending the meaning, then all of these words are songs. Like the aforementioned chittering of birds. So then it's quite obvious to understand why do children's books always rhyme? Why have we always had nursery rhymes? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Life is but a dream. This kind of thing. These mnemonic devices, so to speak, that are so easy for us to memorize. Now, why? That song is based deep in our unconscious. So if they can't understand the words, we'll give them something sungy. We'll rhyme, and that will stick as it does with us. Deep. It's deep. This chanting quality as well that we see still yet in more tribal indigenous religious spiritual expression this resonating this opening of the vowel sounds this singing this direct emotive expression unencumbered by word superseding going deeper than word ever could it moves and expresses beyond the capacity of what words can contain this is the unbeknownst this is an expression of the ineffable but of course it might not hit us that way because you have to have the ears to hear and you have to be the right person to receive what is being given, what is being shown and communicated through what we might otherwise call chanting. But in the investigation of words themselves, there is a greater science to understanding their function and why they meet us the way that they do. And this sincerely is a subject that is to anybody's interest. We all participate in this, whether knowingly or unknowingly. When it comes to understanding the fundamental nature of words, we have to start to pay attention to the dipping up and down that is natural to each and every word given. You might notice the kind of dancing nature when you're listening to the pure sound of it. There are kind of, um, let's just say, three different categories of approach that we need to first tackle in order to really start to divulge the wisdom of the kind of science that I'm talking about here. So at first it might seem like I'm going to give an English lesson when in fact it's going to go much deeper, much more fundamental than that, a more observation of the language of itself and the augmentation of breath as formerly mentioned. So the three categories that we need. This top one here is going to denote our Yang principle, which we will call Mute. Mute or yang, depending. This next is our yin principle or more effeminate qualities, and that will be liquid. We'll designate it as liquid and with this kind of symbol. And then lastly is going to be the fricative, which is going to be a kind of mixing ground of the two. And so we'll just call that either fricative or mix, but Importantly, these are the symbols that we'll need to approach this matter. Now, when it comes to names, why do certain names carry certain associations? Why do they carry in a spirit of themselves, so to speak? 
in this modern day, Brad and Chad might have an association with having that kind of name. Versus if you said Brad Lee instead, then that's going to be a little bit different. That's going to be a different sort of character than Brad is going to be, or Karen, classically, or a Tiffany. Each of these kinds of uh, names, utterances, sounds bring about this kind of psychological interpretation. But there is something more fundamental at work here, which I've already drawn up with these names. Now, when we look at Brad, you might notice on both ends of the name, there is a mute. There's a breaking of the sound. B, break, rad, break, break. So that is going to be the form of a strong masculine name. It's always going to look like this. You have Fred. And that's going to yet again be that break and break on both ends, the interjection of the masculine on both ends of the name. And George, of course, is going to be the same sort of thing. This is going to be a safe bet of what names ought not be shared across the line. This is just going to be for the boys, right? Whereas if we look at instances of Laura or Lily, they're great examples of this purely liquid kind of name. There's never going to be a closing of the mouth completely. There's never going to be a breaking of the sound. That's why we call it liquid. Laura, these sorts of names can be sung, held open in the vocal cords without ever a kind of harsh breakness to them, an interruption of that sort of sound. Now, obviously, none of this is a hard science. This is, in fact, cultural. For instance, you uh, might notice that the French language loves its liquids or how Arabic loves its fricatives and its mutes. This is highly variable depending not just on the language itself, but also the age of that language. Some of these names or some of these words jostle and get mixed around. So this should not be understood as something hard and fast that will always be true. And to kind of show that, I'm having um, these more androgynous potential names shown here. Now, you might notice the form right away. No, no, yeah. Now, here they have both functions. They can have that ending break, that masculine force, t and d. But as long as they end liquid, they tend to be a safe option for more androgynous choices. And so within our lifetimes, we've seen this, these names get kind of passed around on both ends of the wheel. So this shows how there is much more complexity than the previous examples. As another instance to show this complexity. Brittany is a particularly interesting example of a name. Now, Brittany is going to be solely offered to the girls, for instance. But here we see that it's full of mutes. Brittany. Now, as long as it ends liquid, then it tends to be safe. And you might say, well, it's clearly a very effeminate name. However, you might also notice from this sort of deconstruction that we're doing that maybe these names come with these androgynous features, or maybe somebody who bears these more mute qualities in their names might have more broad shoulders, for instance, or have a more steely disposition that these having the presence of uh, mutes in the names might give you hints as to the innate persona characteristic of the individual bearing the name. Now, since this is the spiritual studies course, we've had a lot of God names to contend with, deity names to contend with. And right away, we can use this system of understanding to apply to those as well. Now, notice our God names of the top three here. Dog, duh, is full of mutes. God is particularly interesting because on both ends you have a break just like a Bob or just like a Fred. It's going to have that Brad 
uh, pattern, quality to it. The end is the beginning and the end is the end, if that makes sense. Now, Marduk is also playing into that part of this more masculine psychological sounding name. Now, if we immediately start looking instead to the goddesses, we'll see the pattern holds true. Namu, Venus, Hera, these are goddess names and these sounds can be opened and allowed full liquid. Now, we don't have to just do names because there's a whole lexicon to deconstruct in this same sort of way. And here are examples of more, say, tactile words or abstract words that have a particular poetry about their deconstruction. Now, if we look at the word end, you might notice that its shape, the spirit of its form, its vibratory nature mimics its own meaning. End ends. <laughs> I hope you see what I'm seeing. <clears throat> now, when I bite, you might notice that I have to bite or uh, display, mimic, uh, provide an automatopoeic quality uh, to uh, the word. Bite. That is a great interjection and a showing of the plurality of what it means to be a yang energy. It's not purely just masculine machismo kind of a thing. It's going to have this greater aspect of um, what is yang, what is yang beyond just its engenderment. Now, mumble is quite fun because as you might notice when I'm saying mumble, the uh, sounds are kind of mulling and they're fumbling about. To mumble is to have to mumble. <laughs> and that's the poetry of the word. Now, <clears throat> if I say difficult, uh, one, there's a bunch of syllables there and it breaks quite a bit. Difficult. And that's illustrating its own difficulty uh, within uh, the word itself, I hope you see. Now, easy is easy. It's pure liquid. Easy. It's easy to say. <laughs> so this is a greater observation. We don't have to reserve the descansioning, the spirit of words kind of deconstruction simply to names. It applies to the whole of language, and we might notice how it functions psychologically. Uh, pick this word, pick this word, and start to observe how these things get broken apart, or how easily they flow, or where they break in the structure of the word. So this is all a kind of training or a sort of instruction. I'm not necessarily trying to turn this into a lecture course of how we could break down every single word and then suddenly become an English teacher. But what I am trying to point out here is this kind of underlying structure to the language itself and why uh, the form of it takes the form that it takes. And this isn't um, a matter of anything other than great intrigue. So instead of spelling out the words, we might instead start to notice their form and their song-like quality. Now, when it comes to observing this in particular, we're re-embracing that kind of um, state of being, that early ancestry, that mind of the child mentioned. And we might start to see and notice patterns of how this is all constructed and why it's constructed in the way that it is. Now, when it comes to certain slogans or when it comes to certain poetry, this can be very telling for us. Uh, we might wish to hear a more bold statement from our political candidate, and we might uh, anticipate that we hear a bunch of mutes in that kind of language or how the language of war tends to involve a lot of mutes and breaks and fricatives in it uh, that um, might be very befitting to the tonal and emotive qualities that it's trying to go for. Now, to illustrate how this kind of spell of language works and how we might dispel the spell of language, then we should look at uh, the instance of English curse words, or more like American curse words, if we're being sincere. And obviously, I'm not going to spell them out completely. I know that you can fill them in. Now, 
notice the pattern here. They all end the same way with a break. That break, that masculine finish to the word. As an instance, this is the form shut up. And it's the same sort of form that shut up. Break and break is an illustration that shows in the vibration of the words itself, the intention. Now, that is an instance of a good evocation. If one wishes to dispel or to push away something, then this would certainly be the form of which it would take. And no accident that all of these takes that uh, form, that ending form. Now, if we start to look at more abstract words with this same sort of lens, then we'll see how they too offer up these kinds of qualities that we've observed. Huh, could uh, be a fricative, but I think uh, you understand the point anyway. This is the form. Now, with the meaning of these words to say things like, I love you, or this is beautiful, or this is blessed, or um, there's a nice aura in the sky. Even sky has an interesting quality to it. Um, hate as an antithesis, you know, to damn somebody or to um, admonish or to uh, bellow out and, and, um, beat them. This, this, uh, quality of the word invites the definition and invites the spirit that is sent through the word to the individual it's being shared with. Now, in that vein, hate is very appropriate. Um, and love is very appropriate in its form for, uh, the spirit or the vessel of which it's carrying for the meaning of which it's carrying. Now, there's a lot of fun that can be had with this. You can use this sort of system to decide on naming dogs or pets or children or whatever. Or you can use this as a way to kind of psychologically interpret people that you're just meeting and also to kind of observe the contrast between, say, for instance, this Brittany and this Brittany. Do they have common characteristics? Do I believe that the name inherently gives these qualities? But also there's that more fundamental question of how this vibratory action works and why and how meaning is traveling through this vibratory action. And accordingly, what are we doing with the spirit? What are we doing with the breath? What is the nature of our choice of augmentation? If the breath is just that, then anything can be done with it. It's a canvas. And accordingly, it's more about what we choose to do with it, how we choose to alter it, what we wish it to provide, and what we wish for it to define and to capture. Now, with different languages, we have different instances of having words for things that other languages don't have words for. For instance, deja vu is a classic um, example. Why we choose to name what we choose to name and what we choose to name that thing of which we are naming is all an interesting digression that leads into this descansioning process that I'm um, illustrating here. But no matter what the language um, this is a way for us to approach it in uh, a different kind of lens, in not just a songing quality, but also in the spell, the spell-like quality of language. If we instead want to think of why we like a certain song or why we might not like certain names, we might find that we don't quite like the pattern, actually, that there's something that unifies these things. For instance, uh, say you don't like the name Adam, and you've had some hard history with that one. And for some reason, you just never quite liked the name Lydia, which I'm not saying these are bad names. I'm just saying there might be a reason if somebody just so happens to <laughs> not like these names. I, I have to give somebody's name. I'm sorry. Uh, you might then notice instead... that these have the same pattern. 
And that might be the thing that you're reacting to for some reason. The pattern, the thing that unifies the kind of different things that you didn't know were unified. So this goes pretty trippy. This goes pretty deep. <laughs> This greater discussion alludes to something, and that something is the crafting nature of the spoken experience. <laughs> what do I mean? This world is propagated through stories, through lenses. This is all a craft. The world is ineffable of itself, yet we codify, we create, we make narrative, craft story out of this air. This kind of scratching away at the subject, this opening up the intrigue to the subject is ultimately a basis for discussing the magical tradition and the esoteric traditions. We can't truly say that we might come to an understanding of what these mystics or what these practitioners uh, would call magic unless we deal with the very subject of magic, which is the word, which is the crafting of air, incantation, enchanting, fascinating. These are all uh, aspects of the word. <laughs> it's not our job to tackle that today, but all of this is a kind of intro, a kind of nudging along, uh, introducing you to the field, so to speak. And so with that, we're going to have to just leave it there. The Spiritual Studies course is an aspiration towards providing a free, thorough public education on matters of religion, spirituality, and mythology. The Spiritual Studies course of itself is supported through a Buy Me Coffee page in the description box below. If you enjoyed this session, then it has to be said that it is in thanks to both Scorson, Craig Mitchell, Kristen, Ebon Kim, and quote, someone, <laughs> along with a number of single donation contributors. All of it is with esteemed gratitude. Uh, this is a session I wanted to put out purely uh, for those that have followed the course uh, since its inception. This began with words about words, which wasn't the course at that point, but is obviously a subject that I've been passionate about for quite some time. So I wanted to give this as a more of a deep cut to those that have been um, following this for, for so long. And uh, I, I hope you can see that it's really going to be uh, scaling up. We're <laughs> really going to be diving into some murky waters in the near future.